like each of you, my own education about funerals started with experiences in my family and as part of a community. The very first funeral I attended was for my dad's father, who died in 1982 when I was in the second grade. And I was eight, and I was allowed to go to that funeral. It was a very Victorian funeral parlor in Rhode Island, very formal. And um, I watched everyone stand in line, and when it was our turn, I, I got to go up and look at Grandpa for the last time. I had seen him recently. We had made a trip, I think, to see him in the hospital when he was dying, and what I remember about that trip is that he had a tube in his nose, which I now know is oxygen. I didn't know what that was at the time, but I remember he really didn't look very good. He was very pale and tired, and he couldn't really do anything. And so when I knew that he was dead, I thought, well, he's going to look kind of like that, but maybe a little bit worse, and maybe kind of like our cat Blinky, who had died when I was four, because I'd seen death before. We had a lot of animals and lived on a little farm. But when I got up to look in the box, I thought, well, that's really weird. <laughs> Grandpa's skin was very hard and kind of like a Barbie. No, I was eight, so this was my reference point. <laughs> kind of like a Barbie, and also looked a little bit like he might have got into Grandma's makeup bag, which I thought, <laughs> first of all, you can get into trouble for that, and <laughs> this makes no sense because he can't do anything. What the heck? So I didn't understand. It wasn't scary, but it just didn't really make a lot of sense to me. In contrast to that, the last week that I attended was for my mom's dad, who died in January of last year. And that took place in our living room. We, um, uh, the, my grandfather had lived with me for the last four years of his life, and he lived to be 98. He had a very long, full life. And on the night he died, it was a Saturday night, and we called his doctor to come over to the house, and after she pronounced him dead, um, we filled out the death certificate at our kitchen table. And then my sister and I moved him to the living room with the help of our neighbor, and when my mom arrived, the three of us washed his body and laid him out in the living room and kept him with us overnight and into the next day. And the following afternoon, we had a gathering of friends and family and a tea party to celebrate this passage together with him present in our home for the last time. We played his favorite music on the record player and sat around and talked together and just spent our final time with him. And when the time came, when we decided it was time for him to leave, together as a family we lifted him into the box that we had prepared ourselves and decorated ourselves and carried him out the front door for the last time with the help of our neighbors. Very different experiences for us as a family. Um, and there were some, other than the 30 years between their deaths, there were some influential experiences that informed those choices. The first was a stroke of really bad luck that I had in the fifth grade on career day. We had, uh, this is the day you get to go and see what you might want to be when you grow up. And uh, the teacher went to the blackboard and she wrote all the options, like the police station, the hospital, the really cool stuff. Bakery, I think, was on her. I was thinking, you might get donuts if you went there. <laughs> she said there's limited space in each one, so it's going to operate on a lottery system. So she handed her on a bowl and it had numbers, and I got the very last number. So when it came my turn, the only thing left on the board was a funeral home. <laughs> and I don't know whose idea this was, but I am so thankful for the experience. It was really life-changing and really informative, and I'm very thankful for having had that chance. And I recommend that anyone who wants to go have a tour when you're not in crisis, because that's a different time, and most of us don't do that when we're not facing an imminent death. But it left me with a lot of questions. Uh, this was the fifth grade. So, Another experience that dovetailed with that was just perfect timing. Our, my grandparents moved to Florida in 1985, and we inherited this box of books, among a lot of other things that we still have of theirs. And in that box was this book, Jessica Mitford's 1963 expose of the funeral industry, which many of you may be familiar with. So as a fifth grader who just been to the funeral home, I thought, this looks good. So, in the summer between 5th and 6th grade, I muddled through. There was a whole lot here that I did not understand at all, but there were some things that validated some of the feelings that I had had 
in the embalming room particularly, where I had felt very deeply in my gut, first of all, I don't like the way it smells in here. Second, this guy is really, really nice, but I can just tell that there's stuff he's not telling us, and I don't know what it is, but I want to know. And third, this is not what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> so, if anyone ever wants to borrow this, it's really good. Um, in her chapter, one of the chapters I liked that, that I could really understand because it wasn't about politics, which were way over my head at that point, it was about the history of funerals. Jessica Mitford reminds us what we already know, which is that from colonial days until the 19th century, the American funeral was almost exclusively a family affair in the sense that the family and close friends performed most of the duties in connection with the dead body itself. It was they who washed and laid out the body, draped it in a winding sheet, and ordered the coffin from the local carpenter. It was they who carried the coffin on foot from the home to the church to the graveyard, and frequently it was they who dug the grave. And this is something we all know about our history, and some of us may even remember this being done this way in our families. What a lot of us don't realize is that this is still an option today. Hmm. I had no idea either. Um, how many of you realized you could still you could do this? A few of you. Um, I had no idea that this was possible until 2009 when I was with my grandfather in Florida watching The Price is Right and flipping through his copy of AARP, which is a publication until that moment I thought was completely irrelevant to my life when I was 35. But it was this article on do-it-yourself funerals as a cost-saving alternative for the baby boomers. And I had this reaction that most everyone does when they hear about home funerals for the first time, which was, you can do that? I didn't know you could do that. It's the same reaction that the guy at Staples had two days ago when I was printing the posters of an upcoming workshop we're having on green burials. And he was just fascinated. He had no idea that it was legal. And everyone always says, I didn't know you could keep a body at home. I thought it was against the law. Which I think is a testament to how much we've forgotten what we used to know not that long ago about caring for our own dead and how well we've also been culturally conditioned not to remember that. So until that point, I had thought, there's basically two things that can happen after you take your last breath, and they happen really quickly, and either of them involve someone in a suit coming to pick you up and put you in a vehicle that doesn't have a back seat and take you somewhere else. That's what I thought your choices were. But New Hampshire RSA 290 clearly spells out the rights of the next of kin or a designated agent to be responsible for taking custody and control of the body, which means in our state and in most others, we have the legal right to conduct any and all funeral details, including care of the body, filing of paperwork, and transporting to a final resting place or a crematory in our own vehicle. Um, so I assure you that it's legal to keep or bring your loved one home. Otherwise, we'd be doing this whole thing from jail via Skype, because I would be yeah. there with all those people in that row. <laughs> it's also very safe, despite, despite some of our myths and beliefs about handling a dead body, it's very safe, and the Center for Disease Control has publicly said so. Essentially, you use the same universal precautions you would use on a person who's still alive. And in fact, in many cases, a deceased person is less of a risk because the host now is no longer living, and so many of the things that we might worry about in terms of infectious things are no longer living either. So I was having this talk with Lee, who's here today. She's uh, the director of New Hampshire Free, and she, we were talking about funeral planning and how overwhelming and complicated it can be, and she said, well, you know, there's really these two questions you have to ask. And they are, number one, where will the body be sheltered, meaning where is it going to stay between the time of death and the time of final disposition? And what's the plan for final disposition? And if you know the answers to those two questions, you can build around those. So a home funeral is just simply a funeral that takes place when the body is sheltered by the family at home or in the care of a spiritual community rather than in the custody of a funeral director. And a lot of people know that there's a 48-hour mandatory waiting period if you choose cremation. You don't get cremated right away. There's a waiting period. So you can, you can choose to shelter the body of your loved one in your own home, or you can choose to have them sheltered in a, in a funeral home where they may be in a storage, um, sort of like a, a basement a lot of times. It's not necessarily a cooler. It's just a cool room, which you can accomplish at home if you should decide to do that. It's very easy to manage. Sorry, I gotta catch my breath. 
I've never been in a pulpit. This is a weird experience. <laughs> Bear with me. So a family, a family directed funeral can take many forms and can really incorporate any traditions. It can really, I think the greatest gift is that it allows the family to set the pace. It really promotes a non-invasive approach to care for the body and really allows people to embrace grief and loss in a familiar setting, which is where we normally grieve and feel loss. A home funeral or a family-directed funeral might also include completing and filing death certificates with the town clerk, organizing services with musicians and celebrants if desired. It may involve the digging of a grave. It may involve the transporting of a loved one to a crematory in your own vehicle. If you should choose to do so, um, you, can, you can transport your own loved one directly to a crematory, and cremation itself costs about $300. So if you do everything else yourself, that's a, as my grandfather would say, a huia cope, a good deal. <laughs> um, families can also, if they don't want to do everything in terms of a home funeral, they can contract with a funeral director to do part of any of those tasks. So one thing that we like to advise people when they're going to be meeting with a funeral director is to know there's, there's essentially an a la carte menu, which you can choose from. You don't have to get one of the buffet if you don't want to. You can do just what you want them to do for you, including transportation or help with paperwork. You can do whatever parts you want yourself, and that's perfectly legal. The part about home funerals which I feel most passionate about is that they can be very meaningful and give you an opportunity to do whatever feels absolutely right for you. We have many people in our community who've become disconnected from traditional practices or from religions or who live in a, a family with blended spiritual traditions. This is an opportunity to do whatever makes sense, whatever that is, however it should look for you. Um, we've been really trained to separate ourselves from the bodies of our deceased immediately almost after their death. And slowing down the whole process really allows time to absorb the loss while honoring them with care and dignity. I have a, I wrote an article for, I don't even remember what it's for, I think it was the National Home Funeral Alliance website. It was very shortly after my grandfather died, and I was asked to write this, so this is when things were really, really fresh. And I want to share with you this one paragraph about that very thing, slowing down the process. Caring for my grandfather at home after his death was a natural extension of caring for him at home during the end of his life. Neither decision was based on money or convention, but each offered opportunities to walk toward uncertainty and intimacy with openness to experiencing it completely. Caring for a dying person is intensely physical and emotional, and it takes a time to get used to the abrupt ending, even when it's been long anticipated. I woke many times during OPA, that's what I knew my grandfather as, he was a Dutchman, OPA. I woke many times during OPA's last night in our home. It's what I'd grown used to over the years. Of course, I knew in my mind that he was dead, but actually touching his cold forehead, watching the absolute stillness and feeling the absence of life in his empty body reminded me that he no longer needed tending. I could now let go of everything physical about our relationship. All that was left now between us was the love. And I can tell you that was a very profound experience to really viscerally take that in. And I don't think it would have happened without that night to sit with him. I know I would have gotten there eventually, but it happened very, um, it was a very integrated experience of loss. So the other thing that happens in a home setting, which is different than some other settings, is that when you're engaged with family and friends and all the tasks that have to happen, between the time of death to the disposition, you're sharing all these organic experiences, and it can promote healing from the start. People fall into their, their natural role in a family, and there can be a lot of healing that, because you're in an active state of grief rather than a passive state, it can be very deeply healing to the wound of loss. The last piece I want to address is the sustainability of thinking about natural options and green funerals. For those of us who've lived a life of conservation and concern about our environment and our impact on the environment, 
deciding what to do with our bodies when we aren't going to be using them anymore can really create a dilemma. There are many concerns about modern death practices. And I have a, this is, I'll, I'll go over here and see if you can. This is some good information to be keeping in mind about what happens in lawn cemeteries. So each year in 22,500 cemeteries in the United States, we bury 4.3 million gallons of embalming fluid, which includes formaldehyde, 20 million board feet of hardwoods, including rainforest wood, 1.6 million tons of reinforced concrete, those are in the liners and vaults that were buried in in, in cemeteries, and 17,000 tons of copper and bronze, 60,000 tons of steel. These are, these are statistics gathered from uh, Mary Woodson Green Barrow Council in 2013, so this is current information. And that's a lot of resources if you think about it. It's, those are not being used for anything else and think about endangered wood that we have being buried in the ground. Cremation is often thought of as the green alternative, and while it is more green in many ways, and there's a lot of improvements happening with crematories in terms of trying to protect from emissions, um, each body that is cremated uses fossil fuels that reach and maintain 1,900 degrees for two to three hours, depending on your body weight and how tall you are, and that fuel is equivalent to a 4,800-mile drive. That's a lot. They also, when you're cremated, any mercury fillings you have are emitted, uh, emitted is not the right word, you know what I'm saying. They, they leave you and go into the atmosphere with any other elements, foreign elements, or that end up in our air and water. Each body that is cremated also produces 250 pounds of carbon dioxide, which is a lot. So where does that leave you? What's the greenest way to go? But embalming is not required in any state. So if you thought that was something that had to happen, it does not. It's not a requirement. And cemetery vaults are not either, although they're usually required by cemetery policy. So it's an important thing to remember when you're talking about this and making plans between law and policy. But we do have an op option of being buried naturally, like Barney was, the cat. And the question is, where, where do we do that? If you happen to have the right acreage in rural property, you can be buried on your own land. It's perfectly legal. You can be buried in your backyard. There's some things you have to learn and do about that if you'd like to, but it is legal. And I think zoning in Tamworth, I don't even think you have... <laughs> you pretty much do what you want. Um, there's, there are such things as hybrid cemeteries, which are more traditional lawn cemeteries where some of the land has been set aside for green burial, natural burial, which essentially means there's no concrete vault. And those of you who may, many of you may know this, but the, the reason that, that concrete vaults are used is basically for lawn management because the ground sinks in as a body decomposes, and so that makes for a lumpy lawn, and so if you have a, a concrete fall, it helps to make it easier to maintain that. So, I'm glad there's laughing today. Yeah. <laughs> it's really helping me. Um, the other option, which I'm most passionate about right now, and which I'm hoping will be possible when my time comes, which I'm hoping is, is not soon, is um, Green Burial and Conservation Cemetery. So what is that? A green, green Burial Council defines green burial as a way of caring for the dead with minimal environmental impact that furthers legitimate ecological aims such as the conservation of natural resources, reduction of carbon emissions, protection of worker health, and the restoration and or preservation of natural habitat. So what does that really look like? There's a, there, are several, there are many in the country. I'm going to read to you a description of Ramsey Creek Preserve, which is an ecological cemetery near the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. This is uh, from a book. If anybody's interested in literature on death, I've got pretty much the biggest collection. I'm happy to lend you anything. This is a book called Grave Matters. It talks a lot about every option you have in great, de in great depth. This, this is from the chapter on natural burial. What greets you when you join the trail at a gap in the trees that serves as an entrance to Ramsey Creek is an eastern woodland timbered with mostly yellow and short-leaf pine, half a dozen varieties of oak, and American beech. In the understory, white and pink flowering dogwood rise from the matted forest floor. 
Altogether, some 225 different plant species cover this landscape, a few of them rare and endangered. Half buried in the dirt and covered over with vegetation and pine needles, scores of flat fieldstones lie at irregular intervals along the trail's edge. Ramsey Creek is a cemetery, but its grounds are so natural, so free of the usual funereal structures, that you could wander into it by chance on an afternoon hike through these hills and never even know that you've strayed into a graveyard. Remains are returned directly to the earth in either pl uh, plain cloth shrouds or simple coffins manufactured from non-toxic, easily biodegradable materials. Physical bodies degrade naturally and are incorporated into other living things. They're caught up in life's continuing cycles of growth and death, decomposition and rebirth, so the dead literally nourish and sustain the living forest. For Billy Campbell, who's the founder of Ramsey Creek, a fitting monument to a life well lived isn't an inert headstone devoted to one's memory. It's more good earth. He suggests, what finer legacy could you leave behind than acres of beautiful woods, your final act in death contributing to the preservation of wildlife? Which I think is really beautiful. There's an article that was written uh, called Rest in Green Peace. I've always been really big on puns. And this woman, <laughs> Cassie Gaynor, who wrote for WellPlanet.com in 2000, said, True environmentalists never die. They just get greener. In fact, <laughs> a woodland burial may help make dying the most eco-friendly thing a person may ever do. <laughs> there is not currently this option in New Hampshire. There is no woodland cemetery preserve in the state of New Hampshire or green cemetery in the state of New Hampshire. But there is absolutely no reason that there couldn't be. If you want to learn more about how we can make this happen for us, I would love to talk more with you. We do have an upcoming workshop in Plymouth in April, which if there's information here about, it's going to be Mary Woodson from the Green Burial Council talking about how we can do this here. And it's something that I'm very hopeful will happen so that people who choose that option could have that here. I think it's in, uh, it's in Plymouth at the library, April 12th. It's free. And we have more of these posters if you should want to take one. They're out on the information table, and you can pass them on to anyone you know who might be interested. Right. And leave one here so we can get yes. it. Yes, here. I'm going to give it to you right now. <laughs> so rather than investing in the multi-billion dollar funeral industry, this is the first time I've mentioned money, I think, uh, we could redirect some of that capital into land conservation, returning death to its natural place in the life cycle. One of the reasons that New Hampshire Free was formed is because the best decisions we make in life are informed decisions. A lot of times when people um, make funeral plans, they don't have time to gather information and think things through about what they really want to do because it's, it's, a, it's a life crisis at that moment. So I encourage you to think about and learn about any option at all that you may be considering. And explore, ask questions, read. There's lots to know. And I guess what I would leave you with is that I hope that today, after you leave here, you start a conversation with yourself about what would really be meaningful to you. What would you like to do when the time comes that you no longer need to your body anymore? It's no longer of service to you. And when you feel like you know, talk to somebody that you care about about that so that they know what you want to do too, because it's really important to share that information. The last thing I'd like to say is... A quote from this book, another one from my collection, Dealing Creatively with Death, which is a great resource. And I'd like you to just remember, if anything you take away from today, is that grief has many dimensions, which are experienced by different people in different ways. Likewise, death ceremonies take many forms. Do not, do not be coerced into passive acceptance of a conventional pattern. Do not be afraid to be creative. Remember that death is a natural event and an occasion for the honest expression of your deepest values. In closing, I'd like to pass around a picture. This is a, a picture from my grandfather's funeral. It's my favorite picture that was taken that day, and I think it really captures the essence of what that experience was like in our family and the intimacy of that experience. So I'll just you can pass it around as we're singing. Thank you. <laughs>